What's up, guys? Let me know that you can hear me because I turned my mic on late. Um, this is just a knife sharpening. I um, had a couple knives I had to sharpen up and uh, just decided to go live. Um, been having a hell of a day, so I figure I might as well just end it off by sharpening some knives and uh, clearing my mind. So, um, how's everybody doing? Um, I do have, by the way, I know this is strange, right? But this winds up in a different feed. That's why I'm doing it like this. I do have the secondary camera set up by the um, the microscope if we want to look at some edges after. So, thinking about sharpening up, I got a couple chef knives. I need to sharpen up. Um, I technically got a couple folders, too. Um, but uh, But I'm not sure if we'll get to those. Um, check out this damn gravity knife I bought. Why the hell did I buy this? Um, I mean, it makes it for a cool video, right? But it's nothing like the damn EXL. I mean, this thing is just a million times better. I'm sure you guys seen my little short I did on that. I also bought one of those little, um, cap guns you keep seeing all over the place. So, I'm going to start off, never mind, Ron. What's up, Ron? What's going on, Big Hams? What's up, Haven? Thank you guys for showing up. Um, I'm pretty sure this should be showing up in the shorts feed. We'll know if we see a bunch of people in here that we don't normally see. But, uh, yeah, thank you guys for joining. We're going to start sharpening here in just one second. I'm just pulling this um, the show up in the background so I can see what's going on. Bang. All right. So... I got in a, a Toma 140 here. Um, I always recommend diamond plates. You know, I think the worst thing you can do, not the worst, but a bad thing you can do is try to get the, because I did this and that's why I know, is try to get the most affordable stone that works. Because <laughs> I did that, man. And it's just not a good idea. Because what winds up happening is, is it winds up becoming a nightmare. It doesn't work very well. And then your perception of sharpening it is not good. It doesn't cut fast. It doesn't leave good results. It's a nightmare to deal with. You got to constantly keep on getting it wet. Then you got to dish. Now you got to flatten it. With a diamond plate, it cuts really fast. It's perfectly flat. You don't have to worry about watering it. You don't have to worry about nothing. You just put that damn edge on the stone and start going to town. And that is a beautiful thing. Is it a waste of time to remove the burr on each stone? Um, yeah, you don't have to do that. I wouldn't remove it on each stone. What I would do is I'd flip it. So when you work on one side, so like after I'm done working on this side and I got the burr over on this side, and I'm going to start sharpening on this side, I'll do one reverse pass, maybe two or three, just like that, just to flip it over, to get it out of the way. That way it does hang on. Because personally for me, I have found that it's better to let the burr hang on and just flip back and forth through each stone. And then at the end, when it pops off, it's been fatigued so much that it just pops off really nicely. Just use the Lansky system. Worked great. Um, you know, the Lansky system, it works. I wouldn't say it works great. Uh, the thing is, is that if you if you use, like, say, a lot of other systems. Uh-oh. Hold on. Something just popped up. If you used a lot of other systems, you'd realize how much time that thing takes. Especially if you do something thick. You can't do fixed blades on that. You know, you can do maybe some some thinner knives, some light duty knives, but even then it still takes so long. I remember one time I was trying to sharpen up a 940, a Benchmade 940 on the Lansky, and it took me like two and a half hours. Also, if you're gonna use the Lansky, make sure you get the extra coarse diamond, the coarse and the medium diamond. How about the DMTs? So I got DMT. You talking about DMT diamond plates? Yeah, DMTs are good. Personally, though, man, um, I've got both ultra sharp and DMT. I'll be honest, man. The uh, the ultra sharps I think are a little bit better. I hate to say that because the um, the the uh, the DMTs are made in the USA. The ultra sharps are made overseas and are more affordable, but. They seem to be working a little bit better as far as the diamonds staying on the surface longer. 
this being an atoma atomas instead of using like this where this uses just a sprinkle of diamonds across the surface so it's basically just a thin layer of diamonds across the surface if i put it under the microscope right now you see a whole bunch of diamonds this uses clusters of diamonds maybe we should look at it under the microscope so it's basically like little pyramids little towers like and if you get your eyes close you can see it like it's just little clusters of diamonds all over the surface and um, that makes it to where it cuts really fast and it lasts for a long time. Yeah, you guys couldn't see it. Uh, maybe if I put it on under the microscope, you guys could see it. But you know what? We should look. Let's let's actually I'm going to pull this other thing up real quick. because I want to show you guys what this edge looks like under the microscope before because I already started sharpening one side, but I haven't done the other side yet. So here I got the microscope pulled up right over here. Let's just move this right here. Um, hopefully, I'm going to try to get it as good as possible. This damn neck on this thing sucks. All right, let's see here. So, uh, this is the side I have not done. Uh, let me see. Right there. You can see the bird forming up already. I don't know if you guys can see that very well with the camera. If I turn off my other camera, it will uh, turn the sound off. So... But you can see now, if you see what I've started to do, so that's the part I haven't done yet. And this is what I have started doing. Big, big difference right there. You can see my bevel looks a lot better on this side. But here, let me grab this diamond plate really quick. We'll see if we can't take a close look at these diamond clusters. See how it's little clusters of diamonds? Now watch this other diamond plate. So this is the Atoma. Those are the clusters of diamonds. It's been used a lot. And then here is just a regular diamond plate. See how it's just spread evenly across the surface? Completely different than the Atoma, which is clusters. And these clusters, like if you see it when it's brand new, they literally they look like little pyramids. But like I said, this one, this one is uh, used up quite a bit. Still going strong. Like, it still cuts like a son of a bitch. But, you know, I've been using it for, for quite some time. I'm pretty sure Jared is just fucking with me and playing a very late April Fool's joke. Oh, Dan. Oh, Dan. Um, well, like I said, man, you just won a chance. You just won a chance to win a, uh, a whole knife collection and an EDC uh, storage case. You won a chance to win it. <laughs> now you got to enter to actually win it, though. <laughs> Congratulations, by the way, man. Congratulations. You got a hell of a gift coming. I'll have your shit uh, shipped out tomorrow. Um, I'm going to box all your knives up because uh, it's a lot, man. I mean, I got a whole big ass box full of boxes. I got to box everything up with. So you got a lot of boxes coming. Hell of an unboxing. And then... Um, when if you have an Instagram, uh, do me a favor. If you have an Instagram, when you do get it, um, make a post. Make a post. Tag me in it. Tag Home and Hadfield. Um, we Savivi Suncut, uh, especially me, because I would love to make one. I want to know you got it. But two, it's nice for other people to see that the person that won got it. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Uh, let's talk about selling me that damn silverback three years later. Um, the silverback, which, oh, you're talking about that slip joint? I still got it. I still got it. Is, is that what you're talking about, that blue bone slip joint? I think that's what you're talking about. All right, let's feel for a burr. We do have a small burr. We got a little bit missing at the tip. So what I'm trying to make sure is I want to make sure my scratch pattern goes from the top of the bevel down to the apex. So as I'm cutting, that's my goal. My goal is to, to make not only cut in a bevel, but to make the teeth on the bevel go a specific direction. And I want to make sure it goes from the top of the bevel down to the apex. So, you know, the bevel's really tiny, but you want to go from the top to 
you know, the apex. So right now I'm missing a little bit right here at the tip. So I'm going to drag it over to the tip. I'm going to put my finger right here. I'm going to let it get to the tip. And then I'm going to focus on the tip area. Now I don't want to do this too long. And I do want to kind of rock when I'm doing it like this. I don't want to just go jigga, jigga, jigga. I want to kind of float up a little bit. The reason why is because otherwise you'll cut in a flat spot right there. So just a few passes, and then I'll blend it in like that. Then I'll blend it all in. Never do more than a couple passes without blending it in, doing full passes. Otherwise, it'll be a nightmare to get out. And right there, bam, we got it. Um, got a little bit at the heel. The heel's right here. So we're going to focus a little bit right there. I'm just going to kind of focus my pressure right there with my, with my elbow and my wrist. And then blend it in. Blend it in. Now, technically, you don't have to get this this in depth when you sharpen. You know, you could technically just do the full passes the whole time. You'll still get a perfectly sharp edge. Um, there'll just be maybe little tiny spots that aren't perfectly hit, but it won't matter when it comes down to cutting. I do this for the looks. Um, this is no, it's it's everybody. Anybody can join. Anybody can join. This is literally just me fucking around. I uh, I was kind of having a shitty day, and I decided uh, to end it on a live. Well, end it sharpening, I guess I should say. And I figured, why not just go live doing it? Sometimes, you know, when you're having a shitty day, sharpening can, can really help out. Um, hey, Jared, I have all the Veneve 6x1 stones. What system should I go with don't want to break the bank have so much money in stones already well i'll be honest man you know the system is going to be a very very important part the stones are obviously extremely important too so i i would want to push you at least towards a hapstone um or possibly the ts prof pioneer the pioneer is where i'd push you the farthest if you don't want to break the bank but it's still going to be expensive now, the KO3 is the best, but you don't want to break the bank, and I'm guessing that'll break the bank. Hey, Formula. Thank you, man. Thank you for the two bones. He said, boink. Appreciate it, man. But, yeah, I would go something TS Prof. Hapstone has some good shit, too, for affordable price, and the 6 by ones will fit their system. They don't have any systems that are four-inch. Okay, so we're ready to go to the other side. So now I'm going to do what I said. I'm going to strip that burr off well not off i'm just flipping it so i'm just basically flipping it over to the other side getting it out of the way i can still feel it actually very gentle i'm not adding any pressure when i'm sharpening i'm adding a few pounds of pressure i don't want to add too much pressure to where i can't keep my angle but i need pressure so that i can grind into the diamonds when I'm flipping the burr like this, it doesn't require any pressure at all. Like, I can literally do it with two fingers like this, as long as I can control it. Now, I'm going to lock my wrist. I'm going to use my elbow to pull in and out. So, focus at the heel first. Heel goes on the stone first. And as you're coming across, you want to lift your elbow because you have the blade shape. So, if you see the tip, the tip's not being hit, right? How do I hit it? Lift my elbow. That's how I hit it. So I don't want to mess with this, which is my wrist, right? That doesn't do anything. That's just messing with my angle. So I want to lock this angle in, right? I want to lock that angle in. And to get to the tip, I just want to lift my elbow. So that's one of the biggest problems people have when they sharpen is that they, they do everything with the wrist, which makes it to where how can you hold a perfect angle? It's impossible. You just can't. You're going to convex. That's basically what you're going to do. Which can make you not realize how good you're actually doing. Because you're, you're leaving so many imperfections, it's hard to see through the trees, basically. Um, but when you hold your angle perfectly, it, it, it clears all that up. So pinch, lock, start with the heel. And then this hand, no pressure. This is just like um, a balancing thing. It's like basically just to feel the angle. So if I start lifting, I can feel it at the tips of my fingers. If I drop, I can feel it at the tips of my fingers. 
basically I let the knife can kind of flow through my fingers. Sometimes I'll grab the spine of the tip and pull it into the stone a little bit, but that's it. And then if there is an area I need to focus on, I'll focus there. And when I'm touching it, I'm not pushing. I'm literally just letting the, the weight of my fingers be there. Because literally right here, if I hold my fingers right there, it's going to, even though I'm not putting any pressure and I'm just touching it, it's going to focus more pressure there. So you want to be careful with this hand putting pressure. No pressure with this hand. This hand is basically just for control. And if you are going to focus on one area, that's fine. Just don't put pressure. Non-knife related, do you, Jared, you convinced me to bite the bullet. On the one million lucky. Holy shit, you were right. Fuck yeah, I was. I know I was. You know what's funny is that today I seen that they had a sale on it, but only at one specific place. So not that big of a deal. Uh, but um, yeah, dude, that stuff is something else. I um I got to make sure I get me another hundred bill bottle. And what we're talking about right now is fragrances, guys. Um, I get into uh different fragrances, well, men's fragrances, and we're talking about uh Paco Rabanne's one million lucky. It's in my opinion the best sweet gourmand uh fragrance for a man. It's a gore, so it almost smells edible in a way, not quite like not perfectly, but it's a sweet. Uh, fragrance that just it's captivating man it gets people's heads turning uh anytime i wear it like and i'm around people are always like what the fuck are you wearing like they're always like what is that and they're wanting to know the name um it's so good that's like a compliment getter if you want compliments that's a good way to go Like it's shockingly good. Uh, hey, Neves, I won the We Starhawk last night. Good for you, man. Congratulations, Philip. I tried emailing you twice. Yeah, I got it. Don't worry about it, bud. I got it. I got your email. Um, I normally the very next day respond and say, yeah, I got it. Um, sometimes, sometimes I don't. Sometimes I see them and I see them all on a group and I don't want, I want to leave them there so that I can, cause I'm going to ship tomorrow. So it makes it to where I can go right to it. Um, normally I have everything written down on paper. I haven't written it down yet. Like it's, like I was saying earlier, it's just been a hell of a day for me. So I'm, um, I'll, I'm going to get to it tomorrow when I ship. So either way, it wouldn't have made a difference, but yeah, I got it, bud. I got it. I seen everybody's messages coming. There's only one person I'm missing right now, and it's not from last night's. It's from the other day's uh, giveaway. Um, what was the name of it again? Uh, one million lucky, Paco Rabanne. You can just put in one million lucky. It's a silver bottle. Here, I got it right here right next to us. Let me just show it to you. It's right there. Fuck, I'm gonna spray it myself. Damn it, that shit smells so good. See, this is the stuff, man. Like, if you start finding it difficult to wear anything else. Damn it, that smells so good. Holy shit. Um, yeah, this is a 14C28M blade steel. Standard chef knife, full tang, uh, G10 handles. It does have some um, some pins in it. Um, Tucson is the, the maker. It has really good geometry. It's a big knife. So this is a large um, sh uh, standard chef knife. I really like that it's got this spot right here for the pinch. So that makes control a lot easier with something like this. Like this one right here, this chef knife, the one on this side, this is a Damascus. It's a, um, a 9CR Damascus, I believe. It's either 9CR or 10CR Damascus. Really good though, nice geometry, but this one's more compact. It doesn't even seem like it seems like it, it's about the same size, but it's not. It is oops, sorry, you guys can't see it. It's much smaller. Like this one has so I have so much more control over it than this one. How, how many knives do you have um in my collection or just right here? Um, why the scratching motion? Why this? That's just, when I'm doing that, when I start, I'm just kind of focusing in on my angle to get to a comfortable angle right there, and then I go forward. So it's kind of just kind of getting to a comfortable spot for me 
to hold my because when you start you're, you're you're trying to lock you don't want to move your wrist you're trying to lock your wrist so sometimes it's good to just kind of get a little focused i'm not putting any pressure i'm just kind of finding that spot then once i feel it and that the, the blade is kind of rusted in my hand really good i'm ready to go and we are done with this side so we're going to move to the next stone <clears throat> which is going to be a 300. So the first one was a very coarse stone. Technically, most of you guys could just start with this stone. I say, if you're going to get sharpening stones, when you start, the two most important stones you're going to need is a 300 grit and a 600 grit. That's the most important. You could literally never buy anything else but a 300 and a 600. You'll be just fine. You'll have everything you need. Now, of course, adding on more stuff I do recommend because it is a beautiful thing, especially to like for burr removals, for honing, for, for polished edges, things like that. Yeah, you have to get finer stones. But as far as building the foundation of your sharpening and edges, 300 grit and 600 grit. Now, I started off with a 140 because this is a damn, this thing chews steel. So it basically makes light work out of sharpening. What company models to look for a starter kitchen knife? Voss Deep, that's where I would go. If you're uh, looking just for a good quality, not too expensive, good steel, like this isn't just stainless. This isn't, don't ever buy, if you're getting good stuff, don't ever buy just stainless. You're looking for at the very least, like a, um, a 9CR, a, an OS 10, a 10CR, VG10, something like that. That's a good chef knife steel. 14C28N, even 440C would be a, an amazing chef knife steel. But most chef knives that you see, most of them are just basic stainless. Like they're not even nothing special. They're literal just garbage stainless. These guys, if you get this line, which is the Morgan series, it's... um. Like I said, it's a nine, I believe it's nine CR uh, sand my with like a jacketed uh, 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 carbon steel, I think, or something uh, for toughness. I got a workshop precision adjust elite with extra stones. Wait, oh, damn it. How, for how often I need to sharpen a knife, I think it's all right. Um, what the heck is all? Um, thank you, Todd. I appreciate it, man um these you can get these oh man for like 40 50 bucks they're not much they're not they're not expensive this was a hundred um but um right now i'm flipping my burr like i said since i sharpened this side the burr is flipped over to this side like this so i can feel the burr just run the finger up like that it feels like a wire you can hear it yeah. So I'm going to flip it over. No pressure. I know it sounds like I'm putting pressure, but I'm not. It's just loud because it's a metal wire. Um, but, um, but yeah, if you want to get like good shit, like if you're a chef and you want to get like something to be fucking proud of, I would say go to Steve Kalari, Steve Kalari Customs. That right, I got a Steve Kalari custom chef knife. You get to pick your steel, your geometry, exactly what you want. You get to pick everything, your handle materials, the finish, everything. But the beautiful thing is, is that that is heat treated because he'll heat treat it to a high HRC where you can never buy it from a production company. No production company will ever give you the type of steels that you can get from a custom maker. Not just the steel types, but the heat treat they give you. So you will get, you can get the same steel on a production knife and get the it's steel from him, a custom, and it will be almost like the difference between a budget steel and a super steel uh, because of the heat treatment. So, but the, also the cool thing is, is he, he grinds his down to like three thousands, two thousands behind the edge. Like it's so, so thin. It's like ghost like what, and the benefits of having that super thin geometry if you want that, right? Only if you want that is that one, it'll sharpen up like that. Number two, it'll hone back like that. And number three, it will cut through the fabric of space. It's so damn sharp. Um, you got to be careful. It's that fucking sharp, but it's a beautiful thing. When you cut with a knife like that, 
even if it's dull, it's going through things because it's so, so laser beam thin. So, you know, having a sharp edge on top of it, you never want to cook with anything else again, because like, even like cutting up an onion, it's so effortless. Everything just, it goes through so effortlessly that your food just comes out better. Like, I almost feel like you're a chef when you use those knives, but Steve Kalari customs. I do have a video on one of his chef knives that he custom made for me. Definitely going to get another one in the future. That's something like if you know somebody who's like a chef, they're like, you can get them for like right around 300 bucks. Um, but they're custom, they're hand, they're handmade. But and to your specs, you can get a super steel and everything for that much money. Anyways, he um, if you're gonna get something like for say, if you have a brother or a, a parent or an uncle that's a chef or somebody who's a butcher, somebody who really, really appre appreciates uh, you know, chef knives and uh, culinary and everything, that's the way to go. Man, this looks so good. The scratch pattern looks very consistent uh, from heel to tip. I got the scratch pattern all running at an angle, exactly how I want it. Because look, how do we cut? We cut this direction, right? Even if I'm like this, I mostly cut like this. Even if I cut straight down like that, you know, th that's fine. The teeth are still going to be able to work for that. Um, so in some cases with chef knives, depending on you, you might want to do, a, you know, a little bit of a different scratch pattern. But for me, I find that this works just fine for me, um, having the, the teeth go this direction. Um, now, I'm going to flip the bird. Sorry, I don't know why it keeps pushing its way over that way. So that's just getting the burr out of the way. Um, so are you guys saying, saying no pressure just for burr removal? No pressure just for burr removal. You want pressure when it comes to sharpening, no pressure for burr removal because the stone has everything it needs to remove the burr by adding pressure you you're not doing you're not you're damaging the edge and i'm not saying like literal damaging i mean you're like just like right now when i'm sharpening i'm putting pressure i'm cutting into my edge bevel so in return when i do a burr removal i don't want to do that same thing I, I have i'm doing something different i'm removing the burr so since I'm not sharpening, I don't want to add the pressure that's going to change the scratches that I've already done from the sharpening, because that's what will happen. So now I'm going to put pressure, not a lot. You know, I don't want to make it to where I, I'm um, not able to hold this angle. I want to be able to lock this angle in, put just a little bit of pressure, a couple pounds just enough that I'm able to feel like I'm cutting a thin layer off the top of that stone. Basically what you want to think about. Think about like cutting like a thin layer off of a block of cheese or something. That's kind of the same idea. You got to put just a little bit of pressure and go across. Uh, what crossbar would beat the Moyaro? Um, any crossbar from Kaiser. The um the the drop bear or the escort. I think I have one right here. Yeah. Escort. Because they do the clutch lock. So it's an adjustable crossbar lock. They do such a damn good job with it. Okay, I got one more. Jared, have you seen the Arcane? Yeah, the Fixie. Yes, I did. I seen it on Instagram. It looks good. Yeah, it's a good looking knife. That Tonto. I don't know how much I really like that blade shape on that knife, but I think it looks badass. It looks like a killer knife. Wouldn't mind having one. All right, so now we are moving to 600 grit, which technically would be my last stone in this case. Um, unless, you know what, actually, fuck that. Fuck that. We're, we're moving up. We're going to the big time. We're going to the big time. We're going to do a Veneve um, 50 slash 40 micron right around 600 grit. Soak it up with some soap and water. This is still a diamond. And we're going to flip that burr.
And then when we remove the burr, we're going to do it on a super fine stone. But you don't need this stone. This is a $300 stone, guys. You don't need the, this stone. This is something special. But um, those diamond plates I showed you, um, you can get the three ultra sharps this size for 138 bucks. Three of them. Three, six, and 1200 You can get the two by sixes for like 56 bucks, 60 bucks, something like that, for three of them. But they're only two by six inches, so they're smaller. Will they work on uh, most nights? Yeah, but it's nice having more stone. They last much longer when you have a three by eight stone. So it's definitely worth the extra money for the three by eight. And if you notice, I'm using my body a lot. I'm locking my wrist. My body's moving, right? My body's moving. And then my elbow's moving. That's it. That way I can lock. So it's very easy to just lock in right here and hold that, that right there, right? As long as I'm not moving this fucking part. All right. Now we got the burr on that side. Flip it over. Flip it over. Flip it over. If anyone missed out on Ketchup Purple Militar, they're going, they're doing a limited amount of pre-order starting in 20 minutes. Use my Kaiser affiliate link down in the description. <laughs> if you guys are going to try to get that Militar pre-order, use my damn link. Cutting up an edge, use a strop. That don't worry, use a ceramic rod, then a strop. Absolutely. Absolutely. The one other thing you could do is use like a diamond rod and then a ceramic, then a strop. But at that point, you might as well sharpen. But yeah, ceramic rod and a strop is the way to go. How many people are in here? 273. Shout out to you guys, man. Thank you guys for joining. So... When I'm coming across the stone, like I said, I, I'm locking my wrist and I'm bringing my elbow back, not, not my wrist. So don't focus on doing this because if you do this, that's going to inevitably change your angle, which is going to result in you not being able to cut in a V grind, right? Because your I, the idea is to cut in a V bevel at, at the apex with teeth on it, the teeth are from the diamonds. The diamonds are creating the teeth while also cutting in the bevel. So it's kind of a two-part two process. There's a reason why we're going at an angle. We're going at an angle because the diamonds are cutting in scratches at an angle going up the blade, which is the same pattern that it takes to cut. Kind of like, think, just think of a saw blade, right? Think about a saw blade, serrations, anything like that. An edge bevel from sharpening is literally a microscopic serrated blade or a microscopic um, saw blade. So I'm going to lock my wrist and use my elbow and then maybe use my body. Lean in, lean out, lean in, lean out. When I need to get to the tip, I'm just going to raise my elbow because that won't change anything. Raising my elbow, it doesn't change anything. It doesn't change my angle for damn sure. But that's the, that's, it's not even difficult to do. It's more just muscle memory and people get used to using their wrist. And then when they're told to lock it, as long as you're thinking about it, you'll do fine. But the second you stop focusing on locking that wrist, you'll start moving it. So just focus on it. If you focus on it, you'll be able to do it. I guarantee any one of you guys sitting here right next to me right now would have a sharp edge if, if I was standing right next to you. Without a shadow of a doubt. So if th that means that if it's possible that you standing next to me sharpening, you'd be able to get an incredibly sharp edge, then you could do it by yourself. You just have to listen to these little details that I'm saying to you. It is a lot easier than you would think. Okay, so now we're going to go to this finer stone right here. We're going to finish on this one. This is about 1,200 grit. It's a Veneev um, 20 slash 14 micron. We don't need to go too far with that one. 14C 28M blade steel. The steel we're sharpening right now takes a very good edge no matter what grit. 
So some steels do better with toothy edges. Some steels do better with finer edges. And some steels, medium grit edges. 14C is a steel that does really, really well with low angle edges. So what that means is very sharp. Anytime you hear about the angle, that's talking about the sharpness. A high angle is tough. A low angle is super sharp. So 14C does really, really well with low angle, super sharp edges. And the reason why is because its toughness is off the charts. So it has the stability to hold, you know, a good apex even at low angles. And then it does really well at um, fine grits or toothy grits. Okay, now I'm just going to remove my burr right on this stone. This is a fine enough stone that I can easily do it. So I'm just going to do a few reverse passes. Very gentle. Because this is a fine stone. So my burr's pretty much gone already. If I would have stuck with this stone, then yes, I would have switched to this one and removed the burr on this one. Or I could have removed it on this one. But, yeah, that's sharp. Uh, that right there is four micron. Um, where's my paper towels? There it is. All right, let's give it a couple. You know what? Let's test it first, and then we will put it on the strap. So let's just test it in a little piece of paper really quick. Let's just see if we got rid of the burr. Yeah, I can feel the burrs a little bit there. There's a little bit of burr there. This should clean the rest of it up. Oh, yeah, I felt that. I felt a little bit of burr there. Not much, just a little bit. So that's what this leather is doing. This leather has diamond abrasive across it. It's called uh, Strappy Stuff. I have it linked in the Neve's not the Neve Knife Co. store. It's near the top of the description. Neve Knife Co. Um, you can click on that link and <clears throat> you will see um, Strappy Stuff at the top search bar or top bar or whatever. Um, that is my favorite strapping compound. It's a diamond emulsion. It is a little... Ooh, shit, that's fucking sharp. Um, it's a diamond emulsion that's uh, highly concentrated. My goodness. My goodness. Let's see. That's the test right there. What you guys don't see is that this piece is split right here. <laughs> so... Oh, yeah, it'll cut S cuts. Look at that. Woo! That is shot, boy. Yes, that is fuck you sharp. You got to be careful with an edge that sharp. Any type of edge, when an edge will cut paper towel with S cuts like that, that's a dangerous edge. That's a very, very, very especially if it's properly done, because there's two things there's sharpness. Then there's the bite, and this has a lot of bite. It's very, very sticky. So there's the sharpness, and then the bite, and then the edge quality, right? This is a good quality edge, and we're going to look at it right now under this damn microscope and see what it looks like now after sharpening it, because we've seen it before. Come on. Let's turn this baby on. Let's go this direction first. Uh, the light's not hitting it right on that side. Hopefully you guys can see this pretty well. I know it might be a little difficult with the camera. I'm not, you know, I might have to go the opposite way. Yeah, that's right. And this light is not treating me good right now. Sorry, guys. Hang on. So I'm just, I got to catch it to where the light will work for you guys on. It's a little better. There we go. You can see the scratches going from the top of the bevel down to the apex going at an angle. Hopefully, you guys can see that. You guys might not be able to see that very well. 
damn it. Um, let's see if we can see it on this side now. It's so difficult to hold this up, and ah, oh, fuck it. I'm just gonna take this off. It's really good. Forget about it. All right, now I technically have one more we could do really, really quickly. Um, not sure how much battery life I have on the camera right now because I didn't plug it in. I just put a battery in. But I think we got enough time. We're going to start with the 300 grit. 300 grit diamond, ultra sharp. You can find them in the Needs Knife Store. Link down in the description, the Needs Knife Store and sharpening supplies. You can tell good bite. Once you touch the paper, yes, that's true. It's so true. The paper towel really tells you. That tells you two things. <clears throat> that's why the paper towel test is the ultimate test because it tells you both things. It tells you, yes, it has bite because otherwise it wouldn't cut the paper towel. It would slip off of it. There's knives right now I can grab that'll cut paper and it'll look so sharp. And you guys would be like, holy shit, that's sharp. But if I try to cut paper towel, it would just slip off of it. Then if it's too toothy, it'll it'll catch the fibers. So you can have a sharp enough knife to cut the paper towel, but if the bite's not right, it won't matter. So this one's, um, it's been honed back a bunch of times. So now I see on the edge, if I'm looking at it, there's not damages. Um, it's just been, it's been honed back a bunch. Just to show you guys, we'll cut the edge off. These are diamonds right here, so it is definitely dull now. Um, but uh, but you can see where I've honed it. You know, you can see the um, what's it called? Um, basically, like the other scratch patterns from my other stones. Workshop Pro versus TS Prof Pioneer Pi, uh, Pioneer all day. The Cadet Pro versus the Ko Three. Um, the there's a lot of differences i have them both right here if you want to just go watch my video i just did a top five best sharp best knife sharpening top five best sharpeners and uh both of them are in that and uh the ko3 flip the the flip is different it holds um it holds the blade different it's uh the angle there's just a lot of little differences it's it's a little bit better built a little bit easier to use so that's the thing usually when you're paying more you're usually paying for two things, the ease, where's my fingers, the ease of sharpening. So it's a little bit easier. And because it's not just the sharpening parts, like how well does it flip? How well can you change your stones? How easy is it to change your stones? How easy it is it to change angles? All those little things, the more money you spend, the easier that gets. And then number two, the precision and build quality in the hardware and parts, you know, attaching all the, the parts you know, the, the quality of them. So, um, you notice how I didn't really focus on my angle too much, you guys. See that? I didn't really give a shit about my angle. I'm picking a general good angle, right? I could go a little high. I could go a little low. Regardless what angle I pick, I have to stick with it. So, I generally just naturally lay it down what feels comfortable to me. I don't want it up too high because up too high, that is a steep angle. And one, yeah, it'll sharpen up really fast, but it's not going to be very sharp. You don't want to go too low because that'll take you fucking forever to sharpen. The lower the angle, the longer it takes. So I want to go like right in the middle. And as long as I'm comfortable, though, I want to make sure I'm comfortable. I can lock my wrist and use my elbow to swing it. So focusing at the heel. Right, this is where I'm focusing right here. Now, as I go across the stone, I'm adding about I would say four pounds of pressure, but I'm adding as much pressure as I can to, to grind against the diamonds without pushing down. Okay, because if I push down them, I'm, I'm changing my angle. So I want to keep that angle. I want to go all the way across without moving this. So lock this part in, focusing at the heel. Pressure's digging down, and as I come across the stone and I get to here, now I need to start lifting my elbow because there's a little bit of belly there, right? See that little bit of belly? I have to be able to get that, right? So in order for me to get to the tip, I have to lift my elbow. So focusing at the heel, locking my wrist, using my elbow to do the movement and my body, maybe my shoulder, 
going across, acting like I'm cutting a thin layer off of the top of the diamonds. And as I go across, as I go to the tip, I'm just going to lift my elbow. Bam, right there. This thumb is just acting as a control arm. So if I do fluctuate my angle, I can feel it basically. And then also when I get to here, I can push and drive the tip into the stone. So, so now focusing at the heel. Now I'm locking my wrist and I'm just using my body, my anything but your wrist basically. You can use your body. You can literally go like this. You can do that. That's fine. You can use your elbow like I like to do. You can use your shoulder and your elbow. Just don't move your wrist. That's how you make sure that your, your V is going to be good. So right now I'm using my body and a little bit of elbow because this blade shape, you know, it's got very, very little belly. So it's not much at all. It doesn't require, like you might not even notice I'm moving my elbow. It's so little. And right there, my bull is cut in. Oh yeah, we got a nice burr. Flip that fucker over. And the reason why I do that, because after I'm done with this side, you want to feel, right? You want to feel, it should feel nice and smooth on the side you've been sharpening. So if I'm sharpening this side, right? Now it should be nice and smooth. And this side will have a wire. So it'll be rough. The opposite side you're sharpening. If you're sharpening this side, the burr will be on this side. However, if you don't feel a burr yet, then that means you have to continue because you need to look at it and see exactly what you're doing. My scratches that I've made from my stone has cut in a bevel from heel to tip, from the top of the bevel down to the apex. Top of the bevel, apex. So it's going at an angle, right? So I can see that they've reached the apex. That's how I knew I had a burr already. Now, if you're not good at seeing whether or not it hit the apex, you just feel. And you'll feel, it just feel rough. It'll feel like a, a wire. And sometimes when you first start, you're probably going to have to make it bigger than it needs to be, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But now that my burr is folded over like this, and it's on this side, right? It's a metal wire folded over like that. And I'm, I can feel it. I need to get it out of the way. Because if I just drag it across the stone, it'll tear off. And that can lead to microchipping. Is it that big of a deal for a beginner? No, you can just start sharpening if you want to. But as you move on, I, I think it's smart to do. It just gets the burr out of the way. But when I do that, I'm not putting any pressure. When I was sharpening, I was putting pressure. When I, Anything with the burr, no pressure. Anything with sharpening, a little bit of pressure. So now, again, lock my wrist. Lock my wrist, focus at the heel again. Same thing. Focus at the heel. And then as I bring it across the stone, I just use my elbow to lift. Let's see if you guys can see it. I'm going to just go like, lifting my elbow just slightly. See that? See how I'm lifting it like that? Just to get to the tip. And then I can also use my body and lean in and out. Just like you see me doing right now. I'm leaning in and out. You don't have to do that. But that is a way you can do it. You kind of got to do what feels comfortable for you to some extent. But one good thing is to get the habit of locking your wrist because it won't take you long. You spend, say, 10 sharpenings focusing on locking your wrist. You'll never really have to focus on locking your wrist again because it'll just automatically happen. The problem is, is people don't do that. So then when it comes time to do it, then they really have to focus on it. All right. Um, I believe that's an atoma. No, this one's an, an ultra sharp. The atoma's right here. I switched it. So we're using a 300 ultra sharp. I got myself a Kukri right from Nepal. Hell yeah. I got one too. Handmade. And I was wondering what angle. Ooh, that's tough. So that's going to depend on the geometry. That's going to depend on the geometry and what you want it for. So if you're using it for cutting trees, then I would say you're going to want a, a convex edge, probably a little bit of a tougher edge. 
um, it, it depends on the thickness because it's probably 40, 50 thousandths behind the edge. So a 20 degree edge bevel will be really big. So you'll probably have to go like 25, 30 degrees. Now, if you want a sharp edge, like for cutting zombies heads off, well, then you want to go with a lower angle. It just depends on that part. You know, you know what? We're going to go right to the veneer. My veneer. When I get people to the profile, it feels like a touch game. All right, we're gonna. This is just soapy water. Um, I'm only using it on my veneers, which are resin bonded diamonds. I do have the the video of the stones coming up very soon. Possibly the best sharpening stones on the planet. We'll see. All right, let me uh, hit really quick of my jewel, and then uh, we'll get to town. These sharpening videos are more serious than giveaways are real. Damn right they are. Damn right they are. A lot of knowledge here. Shit, I know a few guys who have started sharpening services since they started watching the channel. And now they're fucking making money. Making money doing it. I quit doing it because I couldn't uh, keep up. Too much work. <laughs> Not that I it was too much work for for that I wouldn't be willing to do, meaning like I couldn't keep up. So it was it was rude of me to take on sharpening um when I when I couldn't keep up because of the other shit I was doing. Mm -hmm. Roller sh rolling sharpeners are only good if you go to two companies, Horl or Work Sharp. The other ones, fuck them. Don't don't mess with them. Um, I got, I got like, I've got all three of them. I got Horal. I've got the, the other cheap ass ones. I got the workshops. I got them all. And I'll tell you what, I did a video, the Horal versus the Tumblr. If you want to watch that, um, the, the problem with the Tumblr is that it does, the magnets suck. It doesn't have two stones. It has one, one diamond stone. And then the other one's a metal stone. If you get the Horal, the workshop, they have different stones you can use. It's just so much better. The magnets are stronger. The angles are better. Literally everything's better on it. So I would say, yes, the rolling sharpeners are great for kitchen knives. Nothing else. Don't buy it for your pocket knives. Don't think it's going to work on anything else but your chef knives. If you have a pocket knife that it works on, good for you. But the majority of pocket knives, it won't. What's the key to a toothy, scary, sharp edge? Honestly, one, obviously, the stone you use, but the, the biggest part to a toothy, a scary, toothy, sharp edge is two things. Low angle and your burr removal. Your burr removal is going to be everything because the hardest thing, the hardest part for a toothy edge is the burr removal because the toothier your stone is, the harder it is to remove the burr. So what I do, my specialty trick is I... Say if I do a 400 grit stone, I will deburr on like a 3,500 grit stone or like a 5,000 grit stone. That way my burr comes off without it changing my toothiness of my, my, my apex. And then I will, um, um, I'll make sure I have a low edge angle at the same time. The burr move doesn't matter uh, what your angle is, but I'm saying when you're sharpening it. The lowest I like to go with the toothy edge is 300 grit. Three hundred grit is uh, usually don't want to go any lower than that. The reason why is because it does wind up getting entirely too toothy, and at that point, it's like a serrated blade. So, in order for it to not snag on things and be a good cutter and be very very sharp and toothy. 300 grit is the lowest I will go. I think my favorite toothy, toothy edge is a 400 grit. I would like to know this thing. I use basswood with stroppy stuff on my KO3, and the edges come out insane. I have to raise my angle for the last couple passes to remove the burr. Keeping the same angle just gives me an okay sharp. Yeah, I do too. When I remove my burr, I, I, I raise it. You only have to raise it up by a couple degrees. Because say if your angle sharpened at this, Going any higher, like 
that little bit I just did, you guys didn't even see it. I went up higher. That little tiny bit right there, you're hitting the apex. So if you sharpen at this angle, when you remove the bird, just ever so slightly make it higher. Not much, but this is the key thing. No fucking pressure. No pressure. If you add pressure, that's where it'll backfire. Because then you're changing your scratch pattern. All right, let's get this 600 grit finish. Got a burr. We're going to flip it. Flip it back. Flip it back. Locking my wrist. Using my elbow. Taking my point. My fingers. Oh, you guys can't see it. These fingers right here. And I'm pulling the tip into the stone. Sometimes I'll let it drag across the blade with no pressure at all. Anytime I'm touching the blade, this hand is never putting pressure. If you do put pressure, it will focus pressure in that specific area. And it will actually not mess your edge up, but you will see it. And if you want it to all look proper, you don't want to do that. Okay, we got a little bit of um, convexing. I'm just going to straighten it up just a little bit. All right, that feels pretty damn good. All right, now I'm going to flip to this stone for the burr removal. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I have the burr on this side because we just finished this side. So the burr's on this side, very gently, like we were just talking about. I'm going to ever so slightly raise my angle, but it's so slight, like it's so slight, but the most important part is how gentle I'm doing this. On both sides. Kind of like stropping, but with no pressure. Even with stropping, you don't want to put pressure really. But this is even lighter. Like this is, you want lighter pressure than the blade. Like you don't even want the full weight of the blade really. And then you can do a couple gentle forward passes. Maybe like two per side, maybe three. Just depends on, you know. The, the burn, how pesky it is, what grit you stop at. Okay. That should be pretty damn good. We're going to do four micron again. Let's clean that off. Oh, yeah. She feels good on that strop. On the strop, I'll add a ton. Like, this, the amount of pressure I'm adding is so little. I hate to even tell you I'm putting pressure. I'd rather just tell you I'm not putting any pressure because then, so you don't put pressure. So just be as gentle as possible while maintaining an angle. You, you know, you don't want it so little that you can't maintain the angle and you don't want to put too much pressure that you're denting the leather. Oh, my goodness. I actually feel a little bit of burr left actually now though. So this is what you want to do. So there's one thing is testing the sharpness, but you still want to take your nail and run your nail at the edge. You sh it should feel like glass. Right now, I feel a little tiny bit of burr. So I'm just going to do a couple single passes. Now I'm going to feel it again. And there we go. Damn it, that is sharp. Look at that. That is so damn sharp. Do a little piece of paper. Check the tip. Heal the tip. One more. That was my fault. Push cut. Yeah, it's sharp. It's very, very, very sharp. So, yeah, there you guys go. Uh, what grit would you recommend for a toothy edge? 400. 400 grit. Um, so I say three to 400, three is the lowest I'll go. 400 to me is a toothy edge. 600 is still toothy. 600 grit is a toothy edge, but it's a medium grit edge. So between six and 800 grit is basically a medium grip. 
between eight and twelve hundred grits, basically a fine grit. Anything above twelve hundred, so twelve hundred to two thousand, is like an ultra fine. And then anything obviously above two thousand, well, that maybe it's not obvious. Anything above two thousand is a polished edge. So that's the way to look at it. I would say, I would say no. So personally, for me, I say start between a hundred and three hundred. That's where I like to start. One hundred grit to three hundred grit. You could start at a three hundred grit. Um, a, a 150 is going to cut faster. So it just depends on how much time you want to spend, but a 300 still cuts very fast. So I say start with a 300 and then go to a 600. If you are looking for just a 400 grit edge, yeah, you can just use a 400 grit stone if that's what you're going for. Um, you can do a 100, then a 400 or just a 400, a 400. You could reprofile on a 400. It's just going to take you a little bit longer than it would if it was a 300. You, what you don't want to do is go any higher for reprofiling because reprofiling takes time. You're removing steel. You're cutting in the bevel. So if you, like, I, you see people online, they'll be sharpening their knives and starting off with a thousand grit. And it, the reason why is because one, their bevel's already cut. So they're not reprofiling. They're just sharpening. And they're it's just a ridiculous thing to even to, to point to people to do that because most people are not starting off with a super sharp edge. Most of them are going to start off with a fucking dull edge. They're going to want to remove steel. So they're going to want to go to a coarse stone first. Not all, not all, but most. Uh, I start at 120 because the knives I sharpen at work are always beat out. Exactly. That's what I mean. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I have heard around 300 grit and 600 grit for a toothy edge, then a few passes on a strap of the six micro. You can do that. Yeah, well, that, that's perfectly fine. You can, um, I like, so my favorite edge and most recommended edge across the board is going to be 600 grit because it is the, the grit that works on all steels. Now, some steels do better with like a super fine edge and some steels do better with a toothy edge. Depends on the heat treatment. It depends on the steel, but all steels do good at 600 grit. So that's the way I kind of uh, look at it. All right, guys, I'm going to get out of here. Um, I appreciate you guys joining me. Um, just a quick uh, live sharpening video. Hopefully you guys got something from it. Um, work hard, stay tough. Until next time, peace. And thank you guys for joining. I do appreciate it.